let's see here. Where is, oh, there we go, video right there. Okay, Arjun, okay, how's that? Does everything look okay? Yeah, everything looks great, man. And, um, you, can, and you can hear me fine. Yeah, perfect sound, perfect good, good, video. Good, good, good. I think okay. we're good to go. Okay. Uh, welcome to the work, work Cloud virtual office over here. <laughs> All right on, okay. Hello there. Welcome to the Leaders of Continuous Improvement podcast. My name is Arjun Patel, and you'll be hearing from the top operational experts in the industry that deal with the chaos of trying to lead projects and Kaizen events that improve processes and eliminate waste. This podcast is meant to provide tangible advice, case studies, interpretations, and ideologies of all things continuous improvement. It really does take transformational change to do a continuous improvement manager's job. So welcome to the Leaders in CI podcast. In today's episode, I interview Paul Akers. Akers is the founder and president of a company called FastCap. That's a product development company that specializes in woodworking tools. He also created the app Two Second Lean, which is available on both the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. This was truly a really fun conversation to have with Paul. Uh, we talked a lot about you know, how lean is applied in China and Japan and the US, and also talked about how you can invoke a uh, culture of, of continuous improvement and actually taking steps to improve the culture. Paul, he's a really eccentric guy, and I think uh, you'll learn a lot from this episode. Here he is. I have to say I'm a carpenter. I was born and raised in San Diego. My dad was an electrical engineer, brilliant guy. I was a C and D student, struggled to do school. Went and got my degree in education, taught industrial arts. After that, I got tired of the bureaucracy, uh, opened up my own general contracting company, built custom furniture homes and cabinets for people, worked in Pasadena on some of the most exclusive houses really in the world, on green and green homes and things like that. Just really had an amazing career. And then I decided I wanted to move to the Pacific Northwest. So my wife and I moved up here. She's from here and it's beautiful up in Washington. I live in Bellingham, which is two hours north of Seattle. We wanted yeah. a really nice lifestyle to live in because Los Angeles and San Diego was nice, but not, <laughs> not as nice as up here. So yeah, Seattle's way here. nicer. <laughs> yeah, so it's a really interesting story what happened. So I had a very successful contracting business, small, but successful. I had good clientele, came up here and didn't have any clientele. And uh, because people didn't have money up here in the same way that in <laughs> San Diego and Los Angeles. Yeah. So, but, but I managed, I struggled, I eked out a living. And I said, well, maybe I'm gonna finally give up. So about 37 years old, I re applied for a job at an oil refinery up here and gonna just do the typical thing, punch the clock like everybody else. Uh, I'm yeah. a hard worker. And there are 800 people applying for the job. This is a very interesting story. 800 people, only two people got an interview and I was one of those two people. And I had a college degree, a successful business guy. You know, I thought there's no way I'm not gonna get this job. There's nobody as qualified as me. I didn't get the job. Oh, three, man. three months later, I invented the fast cap. I came up with a simpler way to cover a screw hole inside a cabinet. I took that product to market. I was very fortunate. And you know, the first month we sold like $3,000, the next month $6,000, the next month eight, 9,000, next month 12,000, and the thing just took off. Oh my I, God, that's I, insane. Yeah, it was really a cool, it's really a cool story. Lots of hard work though, so I don't ever want anyone to think <laughs> it was easy. Yeah. But so my wife and I worked nonstop late hours just trying to make the whole thing go. After about three years, we had about, I don't know, maybe 25 employees. We moved out of our house. We had the old business running at my house where I am right now. And we mm -hmm. bought a commercial building and things were going good. We were making pretty good money. The bank was willing to loan us a bunch of money. And, you know, the bank was going to give me a quarter million dollar line of credit. And I didn't go to Harvard. Yeah. I didn't have a big business degree. <laughs> I didn't have an MBA. And they don't normally do mm -hmm. that. The bank even said, I'll give you any amount of money you want. And that was very flattering because the bank president came and said, I've never seen a company so well run and so well managed as that's this. amazing. Yeah, it was a great, great. <laughs> right. But then the kicker is a week later, I had some Toyota consultants come in, mm -hmm. help me with managing my inventory and I asked them if they could help me. And they said, I don't know because you're clueless and you don't know what you're doing. 
Oh my God. And that's when my whole world flipped upside down. So there's Paul Aker's story in two or three minutes. Oh my God. So uh, I think first off, uh, congrats on all the success with Fast Cap. And Very lucky. Um, you know, you know what they say, uh, in times of misfortune, it's actually a blessing in disguise oh, for absolutely. different opportunities. You know, you, you um, who, who knows if you, if you, uh, if you got that, that position, then you probably wouldn't have gotten all the success you've had so far. So, it, was, it, was, it was divine that I didn't get that job. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, my life is so crazy. I have literally the best life in the world. I don't know anybody has got a better life than me. If I would have got, got that job, none of it would have happened, I don't think. So. Oh my God. That, that, that's amazing. And second off, I, I bet uh, you know, you're probably feeling high and mighty after that bank. Um, bank loan you the money and yeah uh, and then you just got right down yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah, down. got, got um, uh, brought back to reality from this Toyota yeah, consultant. so yeah, I, I guess exactly. um what, what what did they tell you that like you know made you feel feel well, this way like what what, what did they I, see in your process yeah, it's really easy it's really easy so I did things like most people uh, really like 95 percent of the people in the world do and manufacturers mm -hmm. and you know I had quite a bit of inventory and I had a nice looking facility and everything was highly organized and they said why do you have all this inventory why are you making all this product do you have orders for it and I said <laughs> no but I will have orders in two or three months so you're willing to carry two or three months worth of inventory even though you don't have orders for it and I said well what's the option they said, well, make just what the customer wants. And I said, you can't do that because the machines take too long to set up. It takes 45 minutes to set up a machine. If I set up a machine, I need to run a whole bunch, put it on the shelf. <laughs> because if I have to turn the machine on and off for 45 minutes every time someone ordered, I would, I would spend all my time in setup. And they said, well, the problem is you need to work on your setup time. And I said, well, it's impossible. I've been doing this for three years. I know way more than you. You're not as smart as me. <laughs> and they said, well, let me show you. And so they showed me all the waste in my processes and they took a process from 45 minutes to five minutes in, oh one, my God. Week, in one week. And they did it twice in two different of my, my two key areas of my company, making fast caps and making the laser jam. These are my two key products. They mm -hmm. did both things, 45 minutes to five minutes, essentially on both of them. One was 45 minutes to seven minutes. The other one was 45 minutes to five minutes. And we started making one at a time, just what the customer wanted. We got rid of all the inventory racks, all the finished product. Yeah. It was the craziest success story ever. And so then I got on a plane and went immediately to Japan to see what Toyota and Lexus were actually doing. You know, mm -hmm. they, 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 they implemented some of the key points at my facility. And when I saw what Toyota and Lexus were doing, I realized I wasn't even on the same planet, let alone, <laughs> you know, let alone in a different country. Oh, man. They're that um, good. They're that good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. Like, um, it's it's crazy that you you were able to you know um just leave your factory and go and see what other people are doing. I think more and more manufacturers should actually be doing that. You know, seeing what's the best in the business. Uh, Absolutely. I, I'm not sure if you uh, got a chance to look at um the documentary on Netflix, American Factory. Uh, it definitely shows you the juxtaposition between like American factory, uh, manufacturing and Chinese manufacturing and like oh, yeah. how things are a lot more streamlined and um, other countries where it's like, uh, I mean, you know, U.S. was like, we were the spearheads of manufacturing and then yeah, Toyota absolutely. came along and, yeah. and then um, totally uh, reinvented the process of how manufacturing should be done. Um, I, I saw that you, you recently went to China, Japan um, at the end of 2019. Um, how, how was that experience? Well, I've been to China over 50 times. I've been in and out of thousands of factories in China, everywhere from Mercedes Benz in Beijing. I've been every manufacturing plant. You can imagine the things I've seen in China and in Japan. Yeah. I've, been going to Ch I've been going to Japan for almost 20 years now. And mm -hmm. I've been in and out of factories in China and Japan and all over the world for that matter. But yeah, well, there's, there's a big difference. Um, specifically, ask me a question specifically that you want me and I'll answer it because that's a big question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess well, one question that did come in mind, like, you know, uh, I was just wa watching one of your uh, uh, blog posts recently about you visiting the Chinese plant. And um, you, you mentioned that it was a completely foreign experience of like, you know, uh, 3S and getting that on. So I guess what's the difference between um, 
creating a, a ch like a cultural change for continuous improvement um, in China versus like the US? Well, it's massive. So let, let's just start with China. Okay, yeah. so the way, the way the Chinese, first of all, I love China, I love the Chinese people, I hate the CCP, mm -hmm. I hate their government, I hate, I hate yeah. them, right? yeah. so I'm not, I, I don't mix any bones about any of that, and I'll tell everybody exactly, yeah. I, I met with political leaders, I know mm -hmm. so many people in China make your head spin. So my, my, book is, my book has been translated to Chinese, and it's now being done, all the audio versions are being done in Chinese, so it could spread all over China, so I know China backwards and forwards. But anyways, yeah. I bet I literally have been crisscross the country from Tibet to Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, you name it, I've been there. So mm -hmm. the, the difference is that in China, uh, labor's cheap. And so yeah. they're not interested so much in the worker thinking. They want they, they use the worker as a tool to go in there mm -hmm. and do the work. Hey, go and do this work. This is what I want you to do. Screw this lid on here. Pick up this yeah. part, screw this part on there. And they're not really thinking, hey, let's build a culture where everyone's working together as a team. You have the bosses and you have mm -hmm. the minions and the minions are there to work and shut up yeah. and do the work, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's just the way in general it's run. Yeah. Now, in a lean culture, we want to do just the opposite. The bosses want to respect the worker and the worker is doing the work. The worker has a great idea. And, that, and making that fundamental switch in, in the Chinese culture, it's not, that's not an easy switch to make. And more importantly, yeah. the Chinese people who are in the plants are predisposed to that. They're comfortable just doing what the boss says. They don't want to stick their head up because they get they stick their head up in China, you get it whacked <laughs> off. Yeah. <laughs> did, did that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, it, it did. Now, and um, I'm oh, sorry, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. No, no. And so now if we want to contrast, we'll contrast all three countries. Then you go to a country like Japan, where uh, I love Japan. Japan's not a perfect country, but I love Japan. I, I just wrote a book about Japan. Japan, yeah. uh, you know, labor is expensive. And Japan in very much so respects their worker and mm -hmm. they and their their family. When you work at a at, when you work at a Japanese company, you're part of the family. That's the yeah. way that's the way they think of it. So they're very happy to invest in you. You're going to be there a long time, and it's a completely different approach. It's expensive to live in Japan. It's expensive to labor in Japan. So they mm -hmm. have to, in order to compete with the rest of the world, and particularly China, which is right down the street from them, they yeah. have to they have to operate. They have to find ways to operate very efficiently. And the way mm -hmm. the Japanese do that is they're very technologically, they have great technological prowess. Uh, they have great yeah. business acumen. They learned it all from the U.S., incidentally. Most people don't know that. <laughs> and, and, and they do something called Kaizen, which means to make good. So part yeah. of the Japanese culture is to continuously improve. So you have entirely different philosophy between the way the Japanese think and the way the Chinese think. Now, the interesting thing about that, Arjun, which is so fascinating, which most people don't know, is the Japanese culture is basically built on the Chinese culture. The Japanese <laughs> learn from the Chinese. So it's not like they're a totally different group of people. Yeah. But, they, but because of their limited resources and the, and the scarcity of what was available to them, they had to think differently. And so they changed the way they thought. So there's yeah. China, Japan. Now let's step over to the U.S. is because that's what you want. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, uh, I, I was like when I first learned about kaizen and like you know uh, TPS, uh, it talks about you know uh, worker empowerment, and I could definitely see the the extreme juxtaposition between China and Japan. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, like you know, what what's your take on the U.S. and how how do you think okay. uh, the so. The, the U.S. Yeah. Is, is very interesting. So first of all, I love my country. It's the greatest country in the world. I, I, when I speak about the U.S., I don't mean to speak in disparagingly terms, but I want to be uh -huh. honest about it, too. Yeah. So the, the Chinese, the, the Japanese have something called the Americans got victory disease. And the classic example <laughs> is, and I'll explain right now, and I'm going to answer your question. You know, after World War II, we won. We won. MacArthur went over there, did a fabulous job rebuilding Japan. And, you know, we were, we were the victors, but we, we didn't conquer and take anything. We just helped them rebuild and get it back on their feet. And then MacArthur, yeah. MacArthur went into Korea, and then the Korean War started, and he thought there's no way the Chinese could, could beat him. And next thing you know, they sneak 300,000 people across the border of China and North Korea and slaughter us in a, in a battle. Oh so, and, the, and the Japanese kind of looked at the Americans and said they have, vic they have victory disease. They think they're mm -hmm. invincible, right? So mm -hmm. now, the reason I tell you that story is 
now let's go over to America now. So the problem is Americas are very fierce, independent people. You know, Americans mm -hmm. are, we're, we're our own people. We're, yeah. we're not <laughs> necessarily want to be a part of a big family and a corporation, although that, that happens in America, but it's not mm -hmm. like Japan. So we're, yeah. in, we're, we're, we're very independent people. And, and you know, a, a lot of American corporations, not all of them, some of them, you know, get in, yeah. there, get in there and do the job and I don't really care what you think. Yeah. On the other hand, I'm being fair, there are lots of companies that are doing two second lean and doing lean manufacture that are doing a wonderful job of deploying the resource of their people, teaching them, developing them, and mm -hmm. creating this fabulous team environment. There are lots of people that are doing it, but there are lots of people that are not doing it. So it's a mixed bag. So I would say China, uh, almost 100% is just, you're the minion, go to work. Japan, yeah. resources, we all got to work together as a, as a team. America, uh, a great country, great, uh, so many good things, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, shut up and do the work and then there are all <laughs> and there are a whole bunch of people that are that are doing it right so it's a mixed bag in the u.s yeah did i answer so, the, did i answer the yeah question? No, no, no. you know that, that's that's perfect perfect answer um what i'm curious about is you know how do you invoke culture change to become more like japan uh within the u.s at least like how can manufacturers do, do that on their end the Arjun, a great great question there's only one way there's only one way. There's not 10 ways. There's not three <laughs> paths. There's not uh -huh. five paths. There's only one way. And the one way is the leader at the top must fully believe that this is the way to go in the organization and must be completely involved in the transformation of the organization. It cannot be delegated. You can't hire it out. You can't get a consultant. You can't do anything else. That's the only way. The minute the leader says, okay, I get it. This is the way to conduct my life, my company, my organization, and I am going to invest the time, the money to develop it by people. That's the only way it happens, period, end of, end of subject. <laughs> how, how the leader does that, mm -hmm. and, and I've done this transformation all over the world, from Kazakhstan yeah. to China, you name it, I've done it. <laughs> The, the, the way that happens is very, it's a very simple formula as well. And I lay this out in my book, Two Second Lead. The first step is every day when you get there, you have to do three S's, sweeping, sorting, standardize. You have to clean your facility. You have to spend time, 10, 15 minutes, fixing little things that bug you, finding mm -hmm. small improvements, seeing the waste and cleaning and polishing and looking for problems. And then after that, 15 minutes is over with. Then you go into a 15 minute morning meeting where your entire team or department meets together. You talk about your problems. You mm -hmm. don't hide your problems. You talk about your problems. You talk about the improvements. You study a little bit about uh, Ono, Taichi Ono. You study a little bit about Deming. You watch some of Paul Aker's crazy videos on lean <laughs> and then you go to work. But you need to do that Arjun every day for the rest of your life. You can never do it when you have time or when mm -hmm. it's convenient, or if you're too busy, you make an excuse not to do it. It will never happen unless yeah. those things happen every day without negotiation. They are non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. so it's really that straightforward. The person at the top, daily three essing, daily morning meeting, non-negotiable, and then, this is the key part, and then you work. Yeah. It's not, oh, you work, and then we'll do the three essing, and then we'll do the morning meeting when we have time at the end of the day. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. It's yeah. First, you're committed to the development of your people because it is the most important thing, and then mm -hmm. you work. That's how you do it. There you go. Yeah, I mean, uh, interview, I, interview, I, over, interview over. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree with that. You know, uh, um, I, I've been interviewing a few other people, and – everything that's uh, something that's been consistent throughout every single conversation that I've had is, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's like a question I asked, you know, like is, is continuous improvement led top, uh, top down or bottoms up. And usually like, you know, it has to be both, but it starts with top, top down, right? The Not leadership good. has to be able to take control and really believe in the mission of Kaizen and continuous improvement. Otherwise they're going to go for a quick cash and, and try to get a ROI that's immediate rather than a prolonged ROI that could uh, give them a uh, huge amount of returns. Long-term sustainability. 
Yeah, exactly. Long -term, it's, this, is a, this is for long-term thinkers. This is not for anybody who wants to make a quick buck or uh, <laughs> yeah. not, not what it's about. You're wasting your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so uh, I saw that you, uh, um, uh, you you started this new app, uh, two, two Second Lean, right? Um, can you tell me a little bit more about like Two Second yeah. Lean and and um, what what made you decide to create an app about it instead of just like posting online? Uh, yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so first of all, I've been very blessed again, blessed to be an American, blessed to be born in this country, blessed to to have the parents I had, blessed that I've that my company's been so successful. So I feel that it's my obligation uh, to give back, and we yeah. we all of our videos are free. Everything we do is free. I mean, you can get all my books for free. You can go to YouTube, listen to them all streaming, all five of the books. But now we wanted to move to the next level because not everybody's predisposed to listening to stuff on streaming on YouTube. It's not convenient. So we said, how do we move to the next level? And a, a good friend of mine, Tom Hughes, he's an awesome guy. He went to Japan with me. Just a great mm -hmm. leader. He said, Paul, why don't, why don't we create, he's an app developer. He said, why don't, yeah. we, create, why don't we create an app that will, have all your books on it and i said that's brilliant let's do it and then i'll give it to everyone so nobody even yeah to... so now you have the same app basically as audible which costs a lot of money right to have all those books mm -hmm. 20 bucks a copy. Yeah. and you yeah. download my app two second lean play on the android or the other one you don't pay a dime and you're done and you can listen to it i don't know how many languages we have now it's crazy uh, my book's like in five, six, seven languages, and it's coming out in three or four more languages. So you can listen to the audio of my book in all these languages. So one, two, three, four, five, six languages right now. Spanish, mm -hmm. Italian, Dutch, Portuguese, Russian, Polish, and English. No, excuse me, eight languages. Finnish is coming. Chinese is coming. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dutch is coming. It's pretty incredible. Oh my God! It's like it's like uh, Epcot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good. It's uh, a good one. Yeah. Um, no, I, I've actually uh, uh, downloaded it the other day, and there's some really good information in there. You know, like um, it's essentially like an MBA on continuous improvement in in exactly. like on your phone in like in like three seconds, which is amazing. So um, I'll definitely tell our audience to check it out. Uh, I'd love that, and I'll put a link um, in, in the audience as well. Um, yeah. So I, I know uh, we've ran for around like 15 to 20 minutes. Um, any last thoughts in terms of like uh, changing culture and continuous improvement that you would want to uh, give the audience? Well, I would say two things. Number one, three things. Lean is for the smallest group of people in the whole world. Mm -hmm. First of all, so let's say there's a thousand people listening to this right now. There's only 2% of those people that are going to really get what I'm saying. The rest of you, <laughs> the rest, the rest of your audience is probably going to make it all the excuses why it won't work. We're in a different business. We're in the service industry. It won't work. We're not manufactured. Our people don't think that way. Yeah. So number one is it's only for a small group of people and you might not be that person. Yeah. <laughs> number one. Number two. If you are those two, that two percent, this will be one of the greatest decisions, if not the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. If you get a hold of this, to work with people who are fully engaged, to work at this high level of operational excellence, to build a team that is world class, based on the idea of respecting one another's ideas and opinions, and looking for the best way to do things. It's not about my idea. It's not about your idea. And it's not about Bob or Martha or Sally's idea. It's about getting yeah. the best idea for the customer. If you decide to make, take that journey, it will probably be, it was the best decision of my life almost, you know, it's like <laughs> over the top. Yeah. And then the last thing is the third thing is I said two, but here's the three. Okay. Number one is <laughs> for only 2% of the people. Number two, It'll be the best decision in your life. And number three, if you miss this opportunity, it will be the biggest loss and the most foolish thing you've ever done. <laughs> oh man, um, th those are three really valid points. And I, I think, um, you know, a lot of times people uh, misguide lean as something that's like just something that 
one manager does, like a continuous improvement manager does on the floor. But essentially, continuous improvement can be applied to not just like manufacturing, what you're saying. It can be applied to almost every single industry. And also, um, you know, I, I think people just need to wake up and and see what it is and at least educate themselves on like the applications of it to yeah. see how transformative it could actually be. It, it, it's crazy. It's the small ideas <laughs> from everyone. Yeah. That's yeah. All and, um, yeah. And, and it's funny you mentioned this um, right before we wrap up. Uh, there, there's an anecdote that I always reference is Alcoa. Um, uh, it was, it's a huge uh, aluminum manufacturer. Um, their market cap, like I think back in the eighties was like 3 billion. Um, but then when the CEO took over, he, he instituted like, let's, let's focus on safety, lean and safety right. as the number one priority and not revenue, not anything like, like that. Let's right. just focus on worker safety and, and lean. And, right. um, within a matter of like five to six years, their market cap went from 3 billion to $27 billion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's what happened basically to us too. I mean, yeah. we never focused on money. We never made this about money. You make it about money, you'll kill it. We made yeah. it about the development of our people and the rest is history. And it, it's the most exciting journey you'll ever go on in your entire life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was reading about how like, uh, you know, fast cap, how y once you, like, I'm, I'm guessing after the, the consultants, uh, after talking with the Japanese consultants, you probably adopted lean like it was, uh, you know, it was like the Bible for your operations. Uh, and, uh, well, when they, when they when, look at, I knew what I was doing. I was a manufacturer. You got to think about who I am. Yeah. I knew what I was doing, right? You can see my house behind me. Everything I do is at a very, very high level. I don't mess around yeah. with anything. So I'm not yeah. somebody who doesn't know how to make things. Mm -hmm. And if when they went in and, showed, and took the processes that I set up that were 45 minutes and they did it in five minutes, uh, I think pretty much they proved that I didn't know what I was doing, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. There you go. All right. Well, Paul, thank you so much for hopping on this call. I, I know it was brief, but very educational. Uh, Happy to um, do I, it. Uh, uh, where can people find you online? Just paulakers.net. Uh, you can just go, that, that's my website. But my company, fastcap.com, everything's there. All the res all the lean videos are at fastcap.com or the lean videos are at paulacres.com. Or you just type my name into Google or YouTube. Uh, uh, videos are everywhere. You, you can't miss it. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you really can't. <laughs> Anytime you know, I type in continuous improvement or lean on, yeah. on YouTube, I just call it. That's why I wanted to have you today. And thank you so much for uh, giving us, uh, you know, a brief insight to your world. And um, no, uh, ho hopefully people could find people, uh, all your information online. Yeah. Okay. Well, Thanks, Paul, thank you again. Pleasure.